you know, a little touch of the shadow underneath her nose and just a little bit of a touch of her of her eyelash right there on the on the ridge right there in the brim. Well, welcome to day number 165. Yeah, celebrate 165 days in a row we've been here. Hard to believe. And we have a very special guest to celebrate with us, Scott Talman Powers. Scott, welcome. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Eric. Thanks for having me. Tell everybody where you are. I'm in Kalispell, Montana. Okay. Uh, up in the north northwest Montana. Excellent. So, yeah. Scott and I were just talking about how, how lovely it is to be in these quiet places where there's not a lot of people and yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, get out in the mountains and paint. We're, we're connecting. And so, Scott... Um, we went to the last time we saw each other in person, we were, uh, I, I won't mention a name cause I don't want to create a, a flurry of, of issues for him, but we had a, a friend of ours who invited us to a, uh, basically a, a, a hunting week. Right. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm not a hunter. So I just, I just bought the, uh, took the hunting clothes and I think I painted and took pictures, but, uh, there were about, about 10 artists, I guess. And, uh, yeah, we just kind of, we painted together for a week. We had a great time. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I have good memories. Good memories. Yeah. Yeah. They were great <laughs> memories. So Scott, uh, tell everybody uh, a little bit about what you do and what kind of art you do. Cause we got people watching from all over the world. Uh, people who are new to, to you, new to me. And it's a great chance to tell people what you do. Okay. Um, well, uh, I can kind of start from the beginning. I went to the American Academy of Art in Chicago mm -hmm. for four years and um, studied there and at the Palette and Chisel in Chicago as well. And um, so I started out as a landscape painter and cityscape painter, but I went to school for the figure. Mm -hmm. And um, so I always wanted to incorporate both of them. So um, I just kind of ended up getting to an, a, a place where I... Uh, where I was traveling a lot and, and I was inspired by different cultures. And, um, that's most of what I paint these days is, uh, traveling to different countries, um, to, uh, to paint the cultures. And I just, you know, I still love landscape painting and cityscape painting and I try to do a lot of it. So, and so this is just a, an example of, of, uh, let's see, that's, uh, one from, uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. So, uh, yeah, so that's the one that I'm finished up. Isn't that where Christensen lives, Oaxaca? Oaxaca? Yeah. I don't, I don't think so. No? Okay. I may, I may have it wrong. <laughs> it, all right. Well, uh, what are you going to talk about today? What are you going to do for us? Well, um, with the with the video that we're going to be showing later with uh, Life in the Market, um, I just wanted to, um, to show like a, a little demonstration on how to simplify uh, chaotic scenes with a lot of people. And things. So I just kind of give you an idea on how I kind of abstract things and kind of pull people out of the abstraction. And um, and so and also to kind of give you a, give you an idea. A lot of times where I start a lot of my paintings, um, I start with like an abstraction a lot of times. So I do a I do a, a lot of these types of no tan type things. Yeah. And and um, and so. Uh, I don't really have anything in mind when I'm, whenever I'm doing some of these. And some of these I can see like an abstraction that gives me an idea for a painting that might work for a subject. Can you hold that up to the camera so we can see it? And yeah. and yeah. why is it to use different colors, greens and purples and so on, reds? Is it just because it does that well, inform you in a different way? Well, my idea was uh, I was trying to make my mind think differently and... Um, whenever I was using a different color, I may feel different about the shapes. Oh. And I, don't, I don't know if it's, if it works or not, but, uh, but that's what I like to experiment with and, uh, kind of always keeping my mind guessing and trying to, uh, to get a stronger abstract. Okay. So, and I really love abstractions. And, um, and so I like, I do them in, um, uh, acrylic and, and oils and in a sketchbook and just try to, you know, just try to uh, expand my mind to be, get, to be a stronger designer in my work. So, and, and these things really help to kind of have, uh, you know, it gives me the freedom to, to change things whenever I'm out painting uh, a landscape or a cityscape. I 
I will design it the way I want it based on what I'm seeing. And these types of things help me to be a stronger designer, I guess. Well, so. I think I think some people uh, will look at a painting like the one on your easel oh. and mm -hmm. they'll say, well, that's very representational. Where's the abstraction in that? Can you, can you just, while it's on the easel, can you kind of point yeah. that out so people could see, see how that, that abstraction works? The best way, by the way, is point to your painting because if you try to do it while looking at the camera, it'll feel oh, back. Yeah. yeah, true, true. Okay, so you see these large shapes right in here, you know? You see that? Can you see yep. that? Yeah, so that would be like my large dark shape. I had a large dark shape over here. Because I, uh, I put this dark shape over in here because I, there was too much weight over here with the darks. And so it needed to have a dark mass over here. And I didn't want to put like a, a water bowl or or anything else um, over here that would distract from what whatever the storyline would be and so i just needed a shadow coming across here which makes sense with the light direction and um so that that's how i think of it like a light dark pattern um my instructor tetsman skavich at the academy would have me go to the uh, art institute after school every day when i was going to the palette chisel and um, and so I would do these these notans just with a, a, a marker, and 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 I would just abstract all the paintings that I liked in the museum, and so it's just kind of getting myself conditioned for design. And um, so does that make sense? Whenever I'm yeah. That? The other thing I noticed when you're pointing it out, if you were to lay your pointer on the the line right above the tire. Uh, right okay, that yeah, right the you know yeah. the red and the black. Okay, it's pointing to yeah. the man. Yeah. And then if you if you lay your your pointer on the line of the tree branch coming out, it's pointing to the man. You yeah. know, it, it, uh, is that yeah, all I, very intentional or was that, um, you yeah, know, are you trying yeah. to draw attention to the as he your focal point? Yeah, he is definitely my focal point because he's bringing he's bringing um, a, a bridle to put on the horse and him and his son are going to take the, uh, the watermelons to market. So so he's bringing a new bridle to the you know, to put on the horse. And um, so I do I do think a lot about that, uh, on where my placement of my center of interest is going to be. And, um, and so directional lines like this definitely help tremendously. Now, so, uh, I, when, I think about it. Now, I, I would imagine that that's not the same as the photographic reference, is it? Or no, is there... no, it was really junky in the background. It was not good. It was really, uh, there was a, there was a, there was a chain link fence behind it, and um, it, it was bad. This, you know, the horse looked beautiful. I loved all that stuff that was going on in the scene, and um, and so I put the boy in there, and uh, and because a lot of the, a lot of times I'll see a story whenever I'm traveling, and then I will make notes of it in my uh, sketchbook that I like what I like what was going on with the story, and and then I'll piece it all together uh, into a piece. To recreate a story um, based on what I, I saw in person. Great. So, well, what we're going to do is we're going to drop you off for a second. You're going to get your camera set up for your demo, and then I'll make a couple of announcements, and we'll see you in a minute. So, what I have here, um, can you, what I have here is just an example um, from one of my trips to China. Um, I was going to try to show you guys just an example on how to simplify some chaotic scenes in the yeah. background and with your with your main subject. And, and so I kind of drew it out in charcoal um, last night to just kind of speed things up a little bit. But, uh, but also, whenever I'm, whenever I'm um, doing a painting like this, something I'm always aware of uh, on the, uh, uh, the canvas is like where my eye level is. And, and I like to put that in there pretty early on. Um, so, so how do you determine that? Well, you know, I'm standing right up against this woman when I was taking this shot. So I'm, I was probably about right, my eye level is probably about right there, most yeah. likely. And typically from a per perspective standpoint, the eyes of the persons that you're photographing are typically at eye level as well, unless they're, of course, up a hill or down a hill. Well, at yours, yeah. and At yeah. your, yeah. your eye level, yeah. Y yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so this was all flat ground. So if it, if it was really hilly in here, there'd be some other things that I'd have to adjust for. Um, but uh, I just, it, it reminds me to keep all the people uh, kind of above the eye level and, and below the eye level, you know, for tall people, short people to make it more realistic. And, um, and so, 
Um, I will just be painting that as a large shape and kind of break it up later as I need to um, and pull these people out of there. So I guess you know, I'll be painting right through these folks um, and then just kind of pull them out of the abstraction uh-huh. uh, as I need them to support the main figure. Now, can you explain your composition here? Um, if, if, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? Okay, so, so my, my, my focal point is right in here with this woman making her selection um, with her, uh, the bananas that she's about to purchase. And, and I just love uh, market scenes because they're so chaotic, but they have such, uh, you know, there's so many stories going on at once. And so if you can take it like a little quiet moment like this, when her, she's just going about her business and, uh, you know, getting her groceries for her family, um, I love these little quiet moments. And I try to capture that with uh, the camera whenever I'm in, um, it, you know, op- whenever I'm traveling to these places. Um, but I've painted in the market a lot, too. And, uh, and painting in the market is a whole nother animal where uh, you have to kind of like calm your mind and just kind of watch for the patterns. And, um, and people, uh, the people, especially the proprietors, the, um, you know, they do a lot of the same things over and over again, you know, and so you just have to calm your mind whenever you're out there painting from life and just let everybody just kind of run right through your painting and just pick the ones out as you need them, you know? So the temptation I would have is I'd be drawing in all those people behind her back. Is that something that you'll put in later? Or is that something you just want to kind of, you want to, you're just put some energy in there. What will you do there? Right. So, so I want to, I'm always got to, a lot of times I'll even write myself a note to, to everything is subordinate to her, to the main subject. And so whenever, if I put these two people in over here with the little kid, um, I might only put one person over here. Um, It all depends. And I, and I'll create more abstract shapes over here to kind of represent uh, the people. Um, So, so, a lot of times what you can do is if you explain one person in, in a scene like this, but you put similar, similar shapes in the background, uh, it will, it will kind of like, um, it will kind of trick the eye to make it believe that there's a sea of people back there because you've already explained it to the viewer in the fort in, in like the middle ground right there. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, it, it can look like a whole ton of people, but it's a lot of just abstract shapes that are similar shapes to this woman that represents a, a person. Yeah. Okay. Now tell us quickly about your palette. It's uh, very rare that we see somebody put their palette up on their easel like that. Um, yeah. Well, well, this is just for you guys. You know, I don't usually, okay. I don't usually paint like this, but I wanted you guys to see what I was Okay. Doing. All right. I didn't know if you did that regularly or not. No, not, not often. Um, every once in a while, I might do something like that just to mix things up. But uh, but my my uh, glass palettes underneath this wood thing that I built just to kind of you know cover my uh, my tabaret. But uh, I just have a lizard and crimson here, and I have a naphthol red here, and a cadmium orange, and a cadmium yellow, and then I have my titanium white, and uh, yellow ochre, uh, burnt umber, raw umber, sap green, and ultramarine blue, and then I have like uh, a Portland gray over here just for convenience sake and then i have a, a gray that i mix from like old tubes you know all of us have uh tons of uh half tubes everywhere so i'll tube a lot of them myself and kind of change them up and um and then i can just use them as a convenience color so and then i have uh for my little medium here i just have a neo mego from gambling uh-huh. so so and um because i really like things to dry uh you know, pretty quickly. And, um, and especially with all of our deadlines that we have, we gotta, we gotta have things kind of dry pretty fast to, to layer up. But, um, so that's my palette. And, um, and I, and I change a lot of things too. I don't use the same colors all the time. A lot all of times right. to, to change things up just to kind of, you know, just kind of scramble my brains to make me think differently, you know, put a, put a, uh, put a violet on the, on the palette or ivory black and, you know, so there's a lot of things I change, but, uh, but like with this, with this painting right here, you know, I had the had the idea of having more like kind of gray, yellow, oranges with more of this, uh, um, gray blue. And so it's, 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 it's kind of a complimentary, uh, harmony. And, um, and so, and I was going to make the background in here more of kind of a, a grayer violet 
you know, kind of a blue violet, okay. and um, and then make it a little bit more impressionistic with the uh, the temperature, but keeping the va keeping the values close together back there, because uh, I really love it whenever there's so much atmosphere as it goes back and and all the values are so close together, but you, but it it still represents you know a busy scene, right? And yeah, okay. So, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Is that okay? Yeah, please do. Okay. okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start with with her first. And a, a lot of times, whether no matter what I'm painting, <clears throat> a lot of times I like to get the uh, my darkest darks and lightest lights and my strongest color in there. It kind of gives me my borders on um, on how to key my painting. And um, so I'm just going to start. Uh, Somebody asked a question. They said, you know, it's typically we've been kind of taught not to put our subjects dead center in the, in the painting. Um, but you've kind of done that here. What, what's your thinking? Yeah. yeah. So, so the dead center is, is right here. And so balancing it out. So it can appear that it's not in the dead center. Once, once the weight of your, your masses starts to get in here. I see. Yeah. So, so you can take it off just a little bit. Right. And, uh, so you actually had a mark where dead center is. I see those marks now on yeah. both sides. Yeah, I try to I try to avoid those those things. So you know, I had her I had her moved over where her her jacket was hitting right in here, and I didn't like the way this was cropped off to the side. Um, it was bugging me, and um, so this little area right in here, what she's selecting, is uh, is off center, and um, even though this appears to be pretty dang close, um, but I can make it appear to where it's not. Um, dead center. And a lot of times I might do that on purpose where I'll just put it in the, in the center and change things around it to make it feel like it's, right. it, it's, 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 it's not dead center and to create some sort of tension. So there's a lot of ways of, uh, a lot of ways of handling that. Okay. Let me just, uh, get some of these, uh, these darks in here. You typically start out with a fan brush. Um, I have for the past year or two. Um, I like the uh, the marks it makes and the unpredictability a lot of times, and um, and I can change it like sideways, and then go more precise. Yeah, you know. So I, I kind of like that. We just did a video with the Russian master Nikolai Bolkin, and uh, oh, yeah. I was. And I was surprised and he said the same thing. He says, I, I've recently switched to doing almost everything with a fan brush. He almost did the entire painting with a fan brush because oh, he just, yeah. he, he was able to do so much more with it. Oh man. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And I've seen uh, Steven Azell, uh, yeah. New York, New York painter. He, he uses the fan brush a lot as well. Yeah. He and, slams that paint against the, the canvas. Oh, he, I make, know. he makes it fly off that brush. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I really want to take a workshop with that guy bad. I oh. took one. It was fascinating. I want to take another. He's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard he's such a really kind, nice person too. He's very sweet. Yeah. And so he's a very giving guy. Yeah. He seems like it. Yeah. So one of these days I'll take one of his workshops, but, um, but I cannot wait to get uh, Nikolai's uh, uh, video big time. Um, Cause I really admire that guy. Well, we brought him, a lot of people didn't know who he was. We brought him into the face conference last year and mm -hmm. people were going up asking for his autograph afterwards because they just were so blown away by his painting ability. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been, I've, I've been following him for quite a few years. And you um, know, when you teach at that Academy in Russia, I mean, that's, that's the best of the best. Oh, big time, big time. Yeah. Actually I have one of his, uh, his drawing books. It should be in the mail. I mean, it should be coming to my my house anytime now. Yeah, um, he gave me a drawing uh, when we were in Russia. When we finished the sheet, he um, he went to his desk and pulled out a drawing and, and gave it to me. I was just blown away. Oh man, yeah, that would be that would be a dream to have one of his one of his drawings. His wife is an amazing painter too. Oh, I didn't know that. His wife is uh, paints very much like Bouguereau. You know, very classically, academically. Oh wow! Yeah, is there is there a place where someone could see her work? Uh, yeah, well, I'll have to find it and and talk about it. I I took a lot of photos of it. 
Oh man, yeah, I would love to see that. Okay. So so what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of poster like, you know, painting in these shapes. And um and uh and then I can actually compare to my foreground here. Um so I can so I can mix up my background tones to relate to this. Right. Yeah. You ought to go to Russia with us. We're going in a, a year from now, and uh, we'll go see Blokin in the studio. Oh, I got to talk to you about that then. Yeah. That's a dream of mine to go over It's there. an amazing place to paint. There's so much history. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and with Repin and all those guys, yeah, movie. well, we 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 discovered a place where Rep and Shishkin, um, Sarov, um, a bunch of the others, Levitan, uh, they went. It was a kind of a summer retreat for artists, and uh, the last day we were there, we discovered it. Andre Lasinko, our friend over there, took us. He lives nearby, and uh, it, all these scenes that you've seen these famous paintings of were all around us, and so we're going to go there and paint for a day. And it's going to be fun. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! You guys are gonna have a blast with that. All the scenes of Levit Leviton painted and all that. Oh yeah, and we're talking about the possibility of doing a workshop uh, with Joe Wang at the at the Fashion Museum, where we paint and copy the fashions. That's I don't know if that'll happen, but we're talking about that too. Yeah, that would be incredible. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Okay, so I'm trying to. You know, kind of help myself out here by making more accurate decisions related on to the foreground, and um, so I'm kind of getting my bearings here with the block in, and um, so having like a, a darker shape right here where she's choosing those bananas, and I'm going to lighten up these areas back in here to where she pops out, and um, and so I'm trying to step my way through the the painting here, and because you see, there's a lot of a lot of chaos in here and you know see these dark these dark areas where the where their heads are right uh, you know, competing a little bit too much so i'm going to compress these values by compressing mean, meaning bringing them together a little bit more and pushing them a little bit higher in value to where she pops out a lot more and i do that a lot in my paintings to where i i will take a scene like this and i will purposefully make a lot of these uh these mixtures lighter and um and so the main figure pops out a lot more and it'll create a lot more atmosphere and, um, and, and, and kind of expresses the story a lot clearer. And, um, and so I'm, you know, I'm constantly making those decisions. And, uh, so I learned a lot from, you know, Jue Tu, you know, Jue Tu, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah he's, he's a good friend of mine and, um, a Chinese artist and he took us over to China and to paint there years ago. And, um, and I learned so much from him and, and all of his friends over there and, and, uh, Some good painters there, excellent painters. And, well, it's, uh, you know, it all, it all, all turned out to be rooted in Russia because they did the cultural right. exchange. Yeah. And so the Russians came over to China to teach them to paint. And that a lot of them went over to Russia to learn to paint. Yeah. That's what, that's what they were telling me over there. And I was so impressed. So impressed. And we went to, to uh, some of the schools um, that they had over there uh, in Guangzhou and in Beijing. And um, and these young kids were were doing like professional level work. Yeah. Yeah. I just couldn't believe I couldn't believe it. They've got a massive plein air movement going on over there, too. Most of it's watercolor. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize it was mostly watercolor, but you know, there's a lot of oil painters that I paint that we painted with. Okay. Oh yeah, I was supposed to go over there in in uh, April. <laughs> Good thing I didn't go. Yeah, no kidding. I know that would have been uh, would have been bad, but uh, I can't I can't wait to get back over there someday when everything calms down. Well, I was part of why I was going over is I was getting ready to plan a trip to China. Mm -hmm. and uh, take a bunch of painters over there, take them around to different sites. Oh, yeah. 
yeah that place is an is an amazing place to paint and the people are so sweet they're so kind um and i just loved it and they were very generous you know i i, I sat in in a um, family's home in this little tiny village that joy uh uh took us to and yeah. and they shared they shared their potatoes that they these purple potatoes that they were cooking in the uh, in the fire and um and it was great you know i give them a power bar and they would give me a purple potato so i, I well and that's that's really meaningful because they have so little and often oftentimes yeah yeah they, yeah they you know that they, they were extremely happy about uh you know living the way they lived up in the mountains there and and um it gave me a lot of perspective you know so yeah you know thinking about you know my issues <laughs> kind of paled in comparison and just try to find the happiness in the simple things. Okay. All right. So I was going a little bit too dark right there and I wanted to uh, balance that out. And so I'm, I'm trying to think purely abstractly here, you know, trying to just feel the shapes and how they, they balance out and and I will start breaking those things up as I go. Uh huh. But but let's see. Okay, I'm gonna... See, I want her head. See how her, her values on her on her face kind of get too close to that values right in here. Yeah. I want, this to, I want this to be lighter. And so, you know, I'm not gonna paint her the way she's she's uh, she is in the photograph. I don't like her face in that that direction anyway. And um, so I want to put this in here a little lighter so I can pull out that contour of her face. Also behind her too. But she has like a little dark spot that's right on her. It's right on her. I used to have a little dark spot too, but my dark spot is now white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's what it's like with my beard. My beard or my facial hair uh, turned like salt and pepper pretty quick. Uh, okay. I started going gray when I was about 40. Oh man, I started earlier than that. Back whenever my the hair on my head decided to take off. It was the stress of living in Chicago. Oh yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I had a uh, crazy times there, but what a great city that place is. Oh, it's fabulous. Yeah, yeah, I really love it there. I miss a lot of my friends, and um, but it was a it was a great place to to go to school. A great place to paint. Painting on the streets there were was pretty incredible. So were you, uh, did you miss the Schmidt era at Palette and Chisel or were you there for part of that? That was before me, but, uh, but like whenever I would go to the Palette and Chisel, I took some, uh, some workshops with Scott Burdick. Yeah. And, and so I took some life drawing workshops from him and learned a ton. And, um, he was always so generous yeah. with, with his, uh, his teaching. And, um, so, uh, but yeah, but, but, you know, Richard came and did some demonstrations at the at the palette and chisel, so I got to see that. But I never was able to take classes with him, and I wish I wish I was able to. That would have been fantastic. I got a couple of chances to paint with him. That was fun, and he did my portrait. Oh yeah, I remember that. That was great. It probably was, you know, amazing to sit down and just talk with him. He's also a very generous man. Yeah, he is. Yeah, and there's so many, so many fantastic artists that he taught, you know, over the years. And so many he's inspired. Oh yeah, big time. Okay, so I'm still just kind of thinking in large, larger shapes here. And I can I can go back into these like the middle tones and um, and pop some darks and, uh, and and lights as well. So I didn't want to exhaust all my values. 
Yeah. So let's see. I need to get that hat kind of kind of blocked in here a little bit. And so whenever I, I place that in, you know, I'm looking at the value first relationship between here and here. And I don't like the, you know, it's too muddy of a color. So I need to I need to spruce it up a little bit. Just thinking, I love my job. Just watching you guys. So much fun. Oh man, I can't believe I can't believe you've been going so long and uh and you've been doing great. I just can't believe it. That's some that's some uh tenacity. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of great things you're bringing to people. So I, I appreciate that. I love doing it. A lot of fun to do it. Yeah. With these fan brushes, I like that it just immediately breaks up an edge because it really drives me crazy to have like a like a mark that looks like the shape of the brush. I don't know why it yeah. hurts so much. I'm always like messing with it to to make it more organic looking. And uh, let's see. And so I have tools that I'll show you too that um, that I use to to kind of obliterate that, you know, obliterate the shapes and and kind of abstract them a little bit more. Okay, so let me get that on. I'll get this on there. I like how you just scooped up that paint. Yeah, just try, try to see. I have to make notes to myself. <clears throat> I, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to use more paint, less medium. All these different things we all make notes to ourselves and uh and so because uh over the years i don't know what the heck happened to me um i started painting thinner for some reason and because i was painting a lot thicker years ago and uh i don't know what happened so i started making a conscious effort to paint thicker because i enjoyed it more you know I liked what I was doing whenever I could see the juiciness in the paint. See, yeah. what I like what you're doing there is that you re you're really using the paintbrush more like a rubber stamp than than a you know a brush stroke, so to speak. You know, just kind of yeah lay, lay the edge of that on and and just touch it. Right. Yeah. And just make the mark, and then stand back and kind of kind of check it out and see how it looks. And um, let's see. Let me get let me get some of those uh, those melons in there. You got about 10, 12 minutes left. Oh, 10, 12 minutes left. Yeah. yeah. No pressure. Yeah. Oh crap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Time uh, flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Okay. I'll do my best. I probably should have picked an easier subject. <laughs> so well, you don't have to finish the whole thing. You know, you might just finish what it, whatever area you think you want to. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Like right in this little area, you know. But uh, but you're. And then you can post stuff. the finished painting later. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. I could definitely do that. Because I I kind of liked how things were laid out in this one, so I was kind of inspired to keep continuing on after the after the little demo here. Yeah, because I in my mind's eye, I see a lot of like thick, chunky paint with more refined, uh, yeah, brushwork right in here. Yeah, and have a lot of this stuff more sculptural, and as it starts to get back up into here as well, and um, and all these other parts will be a lot thinner. And um, but you know these things take me take me a while. It's 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 really hard for me to, you know, just bust it out. Yeah, well, it's not yeah. something that most of us do, you know. So it's a yeah. lot of pressure also doing it on on camera. Oh yeah, yeah, big time, big time. But I'm getting, I'm trying to get the hang of this whole thing with this, uh, the Zoom stuff and these cameras, and so yeah, any any kind of feedback, I I, I would appreciate it because I'm trying to get better at it. You're doing yeah. great. Okay, thanks. 
But is this in is this in uh, focus? Is it clear? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, good. Because I um, had to get another little camera to attach to this thing to. So I didn't want to have my my main computer so much in my face, you know, right behind me. Oh, uh, God, I forgot one thing. Um, Okay, see this? See this right here? Yeah. This, kind of, this is kind of the idea that I had with that, you know, that basic abstraction. Yeah. You know, I kind of did a few of them to kind of represent the, that scene, you know? And um, and so this helps me kind of navigate my way through an abstract pattern in a complicated scene. I, I, I keep looking back at these things, and it reminds me to simplify, simplify. You know, and not to get wrapped up in all the, all the, uh, all the details. And our mind will fill in the blanks. Yeah, yeah, and and that's what I love. Whenever I go to museums, I, I mean, I wanna, I wanna have something to do when I'm looking at a painting, um, something to explore and something to imagine. And so it's, uh, it's important for, uh, for me whenever I'm looking at work. So I'm trying to get better at that, uh, with my own work. So it gives people something to explore. And um, and that's what I think that Nikolai's uh, work is so good at uh, because he he leaves a lot of things vague, and yeah. um, and so your imagination can go in there and explore a little bit. Yeah, he doesn't talk a lot. He doesn't like to talk and paint. But uh, I didn't need him to, man. I just just watching him. I was I was picking up so many ideas. Yeah, well, it's hard to talk and paint. I mean, as everyone knows, um, man, it's not it's not easy. I used to be better at it years ago, but, you know, disappearing into the woods for many years, um, I have to, you know, practice a lot more with it. I had to learn to talk in general. <laughs> I know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, and also, I, I pay close attention to these, like, spaces like this. Yeah. Um, I, I avoid the, the center parts of these types of things. And whenever I'm, I look at the spaces all the way around and I'll take my uh, dividers that I have and I'll, I'll go into places like in, in areas like this and I'll avoid that center part and, and try to balance my masses. And, and also I keep turning my canvas a lot too, to kind of see how my abstraction is balancing out before yeah. taking it to another level. Um, because, uh, if I don't do that and I lose my the strength of my abstract abstraction, then um, then my my painting will start to uh, devolve in a way uh, in a in the uh, you know that that whole abstract pattern will start to get too broken up with smaller shapes that are um, values that shouldn't be in those in those areas. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. All right, I'm going to give you a seven-minute mark. Wow, man, this is tough. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I, I hope that uh, that everyone who's watching, they, they kind of... Oh, they're loving it. As a matter of fact, everybody needs to be hitting the thumbs up button right now and give them some love. <laughs> yeah, much appreciated. So one of the things I'm curious about is that, um, you know, you've got what, what, uh, Camille Prozwatic would call a, a mud head right now. Yeah. You know, it's just, just, and one thing I always struggle with when I get, I, I take it from that stage. Mm -hmm. Do I want to just keep the shape in there? Or am I going to put some ears and earrings and eyeballs and noses and mouths in there? Am I going to do something that, you know, yeah. because it tends to look too detailed if I do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, like right in here, I want to put a little bit of a shape of the uh, the muscles around the mouth right in there, obviously with her lips and, you know, a little touch of the shadow underneath her nose and just a little bit of a touch of her of her eyelash right there on the on the ridge right there in the brim and um, a touch for her her um, the back of her ear right in there. And you don't have to put that much. I mean, that, that earring is pretty important for me. You know, it kind of gives me an idea of like her personality a little bit. 
Yeah, pull some light in too. Yeah, pull some light in, and and I like little touches like that. Whenever I'll be in a scene where, um, you know, you know, a woman may be wearing a, a type of jewelry that was unexpected, but it gives me an idea of something about what she's like personally, even though I'm just photographing in the market, yeah. and so I, I can imagine what she's like. Here's a comment from Cheryl Akers. It says, Scott, you have no idea how much you are helping us all at this very moment. Thank you for sharing and giving us a reason to grow ourselves with your encouragement. Oh, thanks. That's that very made nice. it all worthwhile. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah, and um, also, uh, these types of things, these are the tools that I was mentioning. Let, a friend of mine, Larry Moore, told me about this one, the knockdown knife. Yeah kind of a foam thing and yeah. whenever i get a little bit more paint on the canvas i'll move the paint around with this thing and um and then and 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 bring some of the the temperatures and things together and keep wiping it off i put this thing through a circular saw to kind of make it a different shape yeah smaller shape but uh but i also use these rubber these rubber things um and i'll cut them in different like shapes. erasers oh what's that it, it looks like an eraser almost yeah, yeah, but it's kind of a thick rubber. I just yeah. got it on Amazon. But then it'll it'll help me uh, kind of solidify my my abstracts, and and then be able to build off of it. And then if I get too much paint on, then I'll I'll put it on there and, and take like a little a little brayer and pull the paint off a little bit and oh, then nice. go back into it and stuff like that. So and also that that pink stuff that you get at Home Depot. You can cut that stuff in all kinds of shapes. And once there's more paint on there, this becomes more beneficial. Oh, cool. So anything anything to make our make us think a little bit different, you know? Yeah. Doesn't all have to be about brushes. It can be paper towel, it can be people yeah. sometimes I'll pull a stick or something out of the woods just to create an effect. Yeah, yeah. You can do anything like that. And I, I just like that a lot. A a good friend of mine is a really excellent painter. He uh he told me that he would use um, uh, uh, match, you know, matchbook, uh, the old matchbooks where you can rip them up and it's like a little cardstock. Yeah. He would paint um, like grass and things into his, his work. Toothpicks and, work uh, great too. Yeah. Toothpicks. Yeah. Especially the thick kind, you know, the kind that have wedges. Charlie Hunter uses those a lot and he uses credit cards. Oh yeah. Credit cards are awesome. I got I to gotta, I gotta, uh, check out Charlie's work on his techniques. Yeah. He's a great painter. Okay. I mean, granted, you know, if I had more time, I would be, uh, I would be really slowing down a lot. Yeah, of course. Well, why don't we do this? So, because we're going to wrap up here in a couple minutes. And then um, if you would be willing to go on to the, this Facebook page where we started out and posted in the comments. That would be yeah. really helpful once once you've finished it up, whenever that happens to be. Once I finish it? Okay. I'll definitely I'll definitely do that. And hey, do you want me to put you want me to put you back on the uh Yeah, sure. All right. So uh anyway, we're gonna wrap up here in a second. This could go on. I wish we had a two hour broadcast or a three hour broadcast so we could do that. I know. Yeah, I while you were talking, I you know, I just wanted to show you something real quickly. Uh this is Blachin's wife's work. Oh and yes. and I don't remember I don't know her name. I've got a book of her work somewhere. Oh but my God. uh yes. I uh I took that. It was sitting in a studio. That's his daughter and his niece, I think. And um so but the feet. Look at the feet, the curled up feet. I know. I know. I would love to see that in person. That's huge. It's a big painting. It's a, it's almost life size. Yeah. Oh my God. Such good form. Good yeah. form. Yeah. <laughs> well, Scott, thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, you're you're a real treat uh, for us, and a, it's a pleasure that you would take a Sunday and and give us some of your time. And oh, I know everybody's grateful. Thumbs up and applause from all of us. Yeah, and thanks um, so much everyone tuning in too. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, today at three o'clock, you're going to, uh, we're going to be airing Scott's uh, video in the market, um, life in the market, uh, which is uh, something that was produced several years ago. Scott also has two other videos with Lil at all the trapper, which is a portrait video and, uh, the city scene, which is the last one. That's the very last video that 
Lilladol released before they handed over the keys to us. Oh, and, yeah. And, and actually, I think actually it's the last one they produced, and it was the first one we released. So it's very monumental. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you again for being on. Just hang on. I'm going to talk to you when I get done, and uh, we're going to pull you off screen. But thank you so much. And uh, Thanks, Eric, and thanks for everybody at Streamline. I really appreciate this.